But uh, I think you can absolutely plan your lives around the fact that we're now involved and have been for the last five years in the Greater Depression. And we're just in the eye of the storm right now. This is going to be a hurricane that's going to be not just the biggest thing since the 1930s, this is going to be the biggest thing since the Industrial Revolution. It's going to be the biggest thing since the French Revolution. It's going to be unbelievably ugly. You got seven billion chimpanzees out there, and uh, they're going to be... This is a whole different speech. I don't want to go into that. But, but I, don't see, I don't see any way around it now. There's, even, if, even if I was elected president of the United States, there's absolutely nothing that could be done right now. If Ron Paul was elected president of the U.S., the first thing that would happen was he'd have a sit-down with the heads of the NSA, the FBI, the CIA, the DEA, and all these other Praetorian agencies, and maybe overtly, but definitely in an understandable way, they'd make it clear to them that things aren't going to change. So you can't turn this around. Well, not only the heads of these agencies and the, the government, the Supreme Court, if Ron Paul tried to turn things around, if through some miracle, and it would be a miracle, literally, literally he was in office, the Supreme Court would knock down the changes that he'd want to make, the Congress would pass new laws, and the people would riot. So you can forget about it. There's absolutely zero political hope. I'm not trying to be a pessimist, I'm just telling you this is the way the world works. So, what's all this gonna, how's this all gonna come unglued? Well, one of the reasons why, despite what I've just said about capital and savings and technology, one of the reasons why the U.S. has done as well as it has over the last 20 or 30 years is because our major export has been dollars. It's been wonderful. We've shipped about seven trillion U.S. dollars outside the U.S. and those nice Japanese send us Sonys and Toyotas and the nice Germans send us Audis and Mercedes. That's a great trade. Come on. And it's propped up the standard of living in this country. But the problem is this. We've actually reached the point where these people are starting to look at each other and they realize that uh, this is like a this is like that game where the music stops, if you don't have a chair, you're screwed, okay? It's a shell game. So they're trying to get rid of these dollars. So there's going to be an absolutely catastrophic financial panic at some point, in the next few years, I suspect, pretty soon. And what's going to happen to those dollars? Nobody outside the U.S., apart from custom and convenience, has to accept the U.S. dollar. The only place you have to accept the U.S. dollar is back in the U.S. So they're going to come back to the U.S. The dollars come back in, the title to companies and the wheat and the computers and the Boeings are going to go out. And this is, this is going to be a real problem, but it's absolutely inevitable that it's going to happen. Well, there's a lot more, because as you know, uh, for some years now the government has been engaging in quantitative easing. And it's amazing how people use this term. They make up a word for currency debasement. And yet everybody uses it. Nobody says currency debasement. They all say QE, because that's the word they use. I, I mean, the, the level of intellectual degradation in this country is it, it's breathtaking. And they use these words with a straight face. So there's trillions more of these dollars being created. Right now, they're just sitting in banks. Banks don't want to lend, people don't want to borrow the bank, but dollars are sitting there. But as they create more of them, they're going to do something with them. They're going to come out in addition to the trillions of dollars from the U.S. coming in. So it's going to be a horrible monetary situation. So let me give you a piece of advice. And if you don't remember anything else that I say, remember this. You better do something. You better do something. You better do it now while it's still possible, even if hard and inconvenient, because it's going to be impossible and dangerous in the future. Absolutely plan your life around that. And if you haven't done anything about it and you don't do anything now, you're going to get what you deserve. Okay? And I'm sorry to say this to a group of anarchists. How can I almost forget this? 
It's that when the going gets tough, the government, I mean, if you watch these pres vice presidential debates last night, I, I forced myself to do it. And I had to gag myself with a spoon after they were over. But uh, there's going to be another war. Absolutely. It's just, this is history repeating itself with the variations, like the 1930s, where if you looked around, you could see, yeah, yeah, there's going to be a war. And this is exactly the way it's building up right now. So the next real or imagined incident, there's going to be lots of new laws, lots of problems, and so forth. And let me tell you something. You people, and me too, are on the watch list. If you're uh, an enemy of the state, or suspected of just not pulling with everybody else, you're in a lot of trouble. You don't want to be here. You really don't. Your neighbors are going to squeal on you. You know, you walk into a Walmart now. What's the sign you say? See something, say something. And they do. So we're just in the early stages of all this stuff. This is just starting. We're in the eye of the hurricane. We went through the leading edge of the hurricane in 2008, 2009 print up a whole bunch of money, makes people feel better. We're in the eye of the storm. We are going to come out through the other end of the storm, and it's going to be vastly worse than it was back in those days, if you recall what it was like in 2008, 2009. Much worse. Lots more laws, lots of social problems, and a war. Why? Because it's not the government's fault, it's somebody else's fault. It's those damn Chinese for creating all that cheap stuff that people like that's in Walmart. It's their fault for unemploying our workers. It's those, it's those damned Arabs for charging too much for their oil. Who the hell knows? They'll come up with somebody I'm probably not even thinking of. And at that point, if you're not one of the chimpanzees that's pulling with all the others against the enemy, the new enemy group, you're in trouble. Why do you so here's my advice. Here's what you should do. I think you should make as much money as you can, as quickly as you can. This is a problem that I've always had with libertarians, incidentally. Libertarians are intellectuals. They're like Karl Marx. And you know what Mrs. Marx said to Karl. This is apocryphal, but I'm sure it's true. She said, Karl, stop writing about capital and make some of it. <laughs> so I'm tired of seeing penniless libertarians that talk the talk but they don't walk the walk, okay? So, get yourself a bunch of money, figure out some goods and services that you can provide to other people, grab the money and get the money out of the country, number one. Number two, if you don't want to get washed away in the flood, I suggest you make arrangements to get yourself out of the country too, or at least have a crib outside so if the going gets tough, as it always gets tough in every damn country in the world, this country's been so lucky that uh, nothing's happened so far. But it's gonna. So if you're not prepared, uh, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be big trouble. Especially, especially for you people who are not among the great masses that believe all the things they're told. You're, You'll be pinpointed as troublemakers. I know that I am. So, I suggest you um, prepare on that. Make money, get it out of the country while it's still legal and possible. Okay, hard, but legal and possible. So this is practical advice. Uh, um, question or two? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Casey, I'm a 20-year-old female college student. How am I able to do anything about my monetary situation? I have no money. Is it possible for individuals like myself who literally have um, the means to do, uh, have no means to do anything, do something? Please educate me on how. Well, that's a good question. Um, you've got to produce a good or service that other people are willing to buy. Now, if you're a completely unskilled but good-looking female, you can... <laughs> But let's not, let's not go there. <laughs> Look, what you got to do is you, 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 the only thing that you take with you, absolutely the only thing you own are the skills in your hands and the knowledge in your mind. That's all you own. The rest of it, 
they can take away from you, and they very well might. There are all kinds of people in all kinds of countries, just within the living memory of those of us here, who've lost absolutely everything, and they have to start all over again. Now you are luckier than most of them, because you're young, you've got sound philosophical ideas, you're going to be in much better shape. But what you've got to do is arm yourself with specific marketable skills and knowledge. What's that mean? Well, you've got to learn stuff. And I don't mean the kind of bullshit you get by going to college. That's worthless. <laughs> you've got to read a lot of books. You've got to become expert in not just one thing, but several things, or many things, because you don't know where you're going to land. It's a general answer. I'm not going to tell you plastics. <laughs> but that's what you've got to do. You've got to think entrepreneurially. You've got to stop thinking like an employee looking for a job, like all those other chimpanzees are, create jobs. What nonsense. So that's the answer. It's strictly psychological mindset, totally, plus armed with skills and knowledge.